Hello everyone, my name is Conrad von Kirchbach and I'm going to present uh, our paper in Efficient Process to Node Mapping Algorithms with Density Computation. This is joint work with Markus Lehr, Sascha Hunold, Christian Schulz from the University of Vienna and Jesper Larsen Treff. So, what are we talking about? Um, imagine you are given um, a distributed system, like depicted in this figure here, where we have different uh, entities like a compute node and each entity can have uh, several other entities like cores, for example. And now we have an application depicted here with P processes that can communicate with another. And these uh, processes should be mapped onto the machine. Now, the general notion is that if two processes are, uh, that communicate with another are located locally on a machine, that would benefit the communication performance. That means that the more local these two processes are, the better it is for the uh, communication performance between those two processes. Now, with P processes, we would ideally find uh, or want to find a mapping onto the distributed machine such that the overall communication performance is uh, maximized. Um, this is not a new problem, it is actually an old problem and a lot of research has been done about it. Um, there are many techniques, for example, general strategies that use sequential graph partitioning like the Vienna mapping technique or the Vienna mapping tool. Um, and if the application has more information attached to it, like more structure into uh, the application topology, then there are some special purpose strategies like the node card algorithm uh, developed by William D. Grob specifically for grid applications. Now, when we're talking about grid, what do I mean with a grid? So a d-dimensional grid is basically defined by its dimension sizes. Um, so the dimension sizes go from 0 to d minus 1. We have an example here of a 4 times 3 grid along dimension 0 and 1. Um, and uh, the grid vertices in this context represent the processes. Now, it is very important to note that there's a direct correspondence between the process ID and the coordinates in the grid. So, process I will always have the same coordinates. For example, process 0 will always have coordinates 0, 0 in the grid. Um, and the size of the grid is then simply the product of all the dimension sizes. That is the number of uh, processes we have in the grid. It is only natural to assume that if we have such a grid, we can also introduce some very structured communication patterns or local communication patterns. Think, for example, of partial differential equation solvers that use a finite um, difference technique to approximate the, the continuous space. Um, in such a case, we could use a stencil with k neighbors, where k is the number of communication partners per process. And since we are already talking about coordinates, we can also specify these uh, k-communication neighbors with vectors. These vectors will describe the relative position in the grid from the process itself, the relative offset per dimension, so to say. Uh, we have this example here in green, so every process here will communicate with the process 1 down and 1 up. So in this case for P1, we will communicate with P0 and P5. It is important to note that we generally assume that the number of communication partners is small in comparison to the overall grid size and that every process has exactly the same communication neighborhood. Now, for our problem description, we need a few additional terms. Um, we will focus on a two-level hierarchical system. Namely, we will focus on compute nodes. So everything that is happening inside of a compute node and everything that is happening outside of a compute node would be of interest for us. In that context, if two processes communicate with another but are mapped onto different compute nodes, we will say that this communication is internode communication because it is between the nodes. And um, if we map an application onto uh, our cluster, onto a distributed system, like depicted in this figure, we have this grid, and we have the system of potentially um, different sized compute nodes, then um, we can also differentiate the term of bottleneck compute node, that is the compute node with the maximum number of outgoing internal communication edges. This is described as Jmax here. And we will want to find an algorithm that minimizes the overall number of internal communications. So to be more specific, suppose that we have as an input a machine with n compute nodes. These compute nodes can have potentially varying number of cores 
um, we have a grid specified by the dimension sizes and the stencil. Then we want to find a mapping of these processes in the grid here onto the compute nodes such that the total number of internal communication is minimized. Um, so the question, the question sounds easy, but it turns out it is actually not. So this problem is NP-hard. It is not optimally solvable in a, a reasonable amount of time. We have proven this using the reduction of the multi-way partitioning, a strongly NP-hard problem, to our grid partitioning problem. And it is already NP-hard for 2D grids. Well, this leaves us in the realm of heuristics, and for that we can devise some constraints or some goals for these heuristics. Namely, we want um, mapping algorithms or mapping heuristics that are scalable, meaning that we want to minimize the amount of communication and synchronization between the processes in our grid. And ideally, these algorithms should be algorithmically fast, meaning they run in polylog uh, time of the total number of processes p down here. With that, we want to uh, dig right into it and present the KD tree, our first algorithm. This algorithm is oblivious to the number of cores per node. This has some advantages and disadvantages, that it only uses the ID of the process and the stencil to compute its core ID. It works by recursively splitting the dimension sizes into two equal parts. And this will lead into densely packed mappings, meaning that processes that communicate heavily with another will be mapped together. Let me demonstrate on this 4 times 3 grid. Suppose the stencil is just implied by the, grids, uh, uh, by the grid, so each process communicates with its closest neighbors. Then we will first, or we will try to locate process 7. We will do so by partitioning the grid along the first dimension, dimension 0, uh, into two parts. Since we are locating process 7, we will see that on the left-hand side of the grid uh, there are only six vertices. That is why we must recurse on the uh, right-hand side of the uh, split. And uh, when doing so, we will try to need, uh, we will try to find a new split in this side. We will find one along dimension 1. Uh, we know that uh, down here there are the processes 6 and 7, and up here there are the processes 8 to 11. So we know that the pro uh, process 7 must be located down here. Then our final split uh, along dimension 0 will finally give us the coordinates of the, um, of the process 7. These coordinates correspond to the core ID on our machine. So now process 7 knows exactly through its coordinates on what core it should be mapped on our final machine. This algorithm works very well because it is oblivious to um, the number of cores, but it can um, create jagged partitions. In order to address that problem, we introduce the hyperplane algorithm. It works very similar to the, uh, the KD tree, but it takes into account the uh, number of cores per compute node. So it will calculate one input number from the possibly uh, different number of cores per compute node. Um, this is then done, uh, this is then used to recursively split the grid into two parts, both having a size which is a multiple of this input number n. Um, the dimensions on which we would split are chosen according to the stencil and the dimension sizes. The main difference towards the KD tree is that we are able to sh uh, shift the splitting hyperplane along a dimension. Let me demonstrate again on this 4 times 3 grid. Suppose we want to map this application onto three compute nodes, each having four cores, then um, the, and the neighborhood is again specified by the grid itself for simplicity. Then we will first try to partition the grid along the dimension 0. Now we can see that the left-hand side and the right-hand side are not multiples of 4. That is why we need to shift the hyperplane until we find a suitable split along a dimension. Um, unfortunately, we don't find one along dimension 0, so we will continue at along dimension 1. And we will see here that the bottom is already a multiple of 4 and the top also. So we have, first, we have found our first split. If um, we look at the bottom side, we see that it's already uh, four, so this side is done, and we will recurse on the top side. And in the second iteration, we will find this final split, 
This leaves us with uh, such a mapping where all of these processes here will be mapped to one compute node each. This hyperplane algorithm works well if the dimension sizes of the grid are well factorizable by this input number n that we have calculated in the beginning. If it is not, if the dimension sizes is are not well factorizable by n, this can lead to very skewed um, partitions. In order to avoid that, we introduce our last algorithm, the stencil soup algorithm, and it works very differently um, in comparison to the first two algorithms. So first, it will cut the grid into strips. Each process can then calculate uh, the, the strip it belongs to, and um, we will impose an assignment direction along the strips so that we can fill up this grid with the, script, uh, with the strips greedily. This is shown uh, on this 4 times 3 grid. So here we have um, our two strips. Namely on the bottom, this is one strip with height 2. And on the top, this is another strip with height 1. We will impose um, an assignment uh, fill up direction to ensure connected partitions. Namely, in this case, in such a way. Using this uh, fill up directions, we can then assign the processes individually to the strips and this will induce a mapping for itself. Now, in order to find the actual height of the um, strips, we will look at the stencil. So suppose we have a process on a grid and an arbitrary stencil. Now, in order to find very compact mappings in grids, we normally use cubes. Um, and if you're talking about average stencil, we cannot use cubes, of course. That is why we use the expansion of the stencil in each direction. Uh, this is depicted here. So along dimension zero, we have this expansion. Along dimension one, we have this expansion. And we're, what we want to do is to calculate this distortion factor towards an ideal hypercube. So basically, how we must stretch a hypercube such that this new rectangle bounds the stencil. This is what is depicted here. And with these distortion factors, we can calculate this compact mappings and the uh, side length of the strips using a recursive formula. Um, this was our last uh, algorithm and we will proceed now by showing the experimental results. So we implemented all the three algorithms in MPI, specifically for the MPI card reorder function for MPI partition communicators. Um, we run a variety of instances, but the grids were always uh, created with the MPI DIMS create specifications. We will show here three different stencils. Um, then we, will, we benchmarked the MPI neighbor all to all collective, meaning we have the grid, we have the stencil, the communication neighborhood is defined by the stencil, and we only measure the time needed for this neighbor or to all exchange. There's no computation done. We will compare ourselves to node count. This is the algorithm presented in the beginning for William D. Grob. It is specifically designed for these MPI Cartesian communicators. It uses a factorization on the number of cores per compute node and the dimension sizes to find a suitable partitioning of the grid. But it is densely oblivious. It cannot take into account different communication patterns. As another comparison, we will look at the Vienna mapping tool. This is a very general um, unstructured graph partitioning tool uh, that uses um, graph partitioning and a variety of methods like local search to improve on solutions. And finally, we will also compare ourselves to consecutive process assignment, which we call blocked. This is often used uh, on clusters and the default mapping of MPI, where processes are just mapped consecutively to the cores of the machine. The experiments here in this presentation have been conducted on the Vienna Scientific Cluster 4, the VSC4, and specifically um, we show results on an instance with 50 compute nodes and 48 cores per compute node. This resulted in grids with dimensions 50 and 48. So first off, we're going to show the results of the stencil that is also presented in the description of the algorithms. We call this a nearest neighbor stencil. This is just where the communication pattern is specified by the two nearest neighbors along each dimension. This is depicted in the uh, most leftmost uh, image. In the middle, we have the sorted scores. 
meaning on the left hand side we have the best algorithm, on the right hand side we have the worst algorithm. The blue column depicts the total number of internal communication that the different algorithm induce, and the orange column is the bottleneck value of each algorithm. What we can see here is that our algorithm stencil strips and hyperplane even outperform this very powerful general mapping tool, followed by KD tree, followed by the node card algorithm that was specifically designed for these kind of communication patterns. Um, and obviously the blocked assignment performs very badly. If you look at the communication time, specifically at the speed up over the blocked mapping, we can see that our algorithms can lead up to speed ups of 3.5 for certain message sizes per neighbor um, and all, always outcompete uh, the communication time needed uh, when doing the reassignment with the node cut algorithm and are sometimes better than the very powerful general Vienna mapping tool. Now, if you look, for example, at another stencil, namely the component stencil, um, which is named so because it will create disjoint components in the grid, mm, we can see a very interesting results, namely that the KD tree and stance strips algorithm, they both manage to find optimal mappings for this instance. This is followed by the Vienna mapping tool, followed by the hyperplane. Here we can see the restriction um, of the hyperplane to the computed input N. Uh, this is followed by node card and then the blocked algorithm. So if you look again at the speed up for different message sizes per neighbor, we see that our algorithm can obtain speed up speed ups of up to eight which is very high we are consistently outperform node card and uh, the vienna mapping tool uh, for some message sizes last but not least we will look at the nearest neighbor with hop stencil this is just the nearest neighbor stencil augmented with two additional neighbors along one dimension and now if you look at our scores we can see that vienna mapping outperforms our algorithms but not by so much this is followed by hyperplane, stencil strips, and KD tree, and all of our algorithms outperform the no card algorithm uh, by a vast amount. In terms of communication time, we can see that um, our algorithms are somehow in the ballpark of Vienna mapping. We managed to find speed ups of up to four in comparison to the block mapping, and we consistently outperform the node card algorithm. Um, so even though Vienna mapping is is good in the actual objective function value, we are in some message sizes somehow in the ballpark. The greatest advantage of the Vienna mapping tool is that it is sequential in its nature. And if you look at instantiation times, we will see for this instance, this was conducted on 100 compute nodes with 48 cores each in the nearest neighbor stencil, that the Vienna mapping tool took over 400 times uh, more time than our uh, algorithms. So specifically, we can see here that the hyperplane in KD tree took about 20 milliseconds for this kind of instance. Sensor strips, which is a bit more complicated, took up to 50 milliseconds, and we are in the ballpark of the node card algorithm. So we can leverage the performance, and we can obtain similar performance like the general tool Vienna mapping in a much, uh, in much faster time. Um, as a conclusion, I want to say the problem is NP hard. It is not feasible to calculate the best solution. We have introduced three new heuristics that obtain very good results for different kinds of stencils. Um, we cannot say that one algorithm is better than the other. All the algorithms have different strengths and weaknesses. And in practice, we would say since they are so cheap, but could run them all for a specific instance, look at the metric and just take the one that uh, performs the best. Um, if anybody uses Cartesian communicators in MPI, um, we provided a shared library where we implemented our algorithms. Uh, and one can simply link our library towards one's application. And the only thing you would need to do is set a reordering flag in MPI to true. And then you could directly use our rearrangement algorithms in MPI. If you're interested in more data, we are happy to say that we provided a um, technical report that can be found in archive. And uh, there we included some tables with more data, more stencils, and more message sizes. Um, finally, I want to uh, name the references of our competitors. This is the algorithm node card presented by William D. Gropp.
And this is at the end a mapping tool uh, developed by Christian Schulz and Jesper Larsen-Trech. And with that, I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for listening and thank you.